Thomas Edison shot this Boxing Cats video in 1881 with the kinetograph he invented. He shot this video to promote his inventions. Well, looks like cat videos were popular even a hundred years ago. But despite the fluffy ad, Edison's kinetograph eventually lost the competition to cinematographer. However, Edison himself used to say, I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thomas Edison wasn't only a brilliant inventor who owned about 4,000 patents, but the greatest entrepreneur of the 19th century as well. This video is dedicated to his enterprise, the company he founded 144 years ago, General Electric. It was General Electric that made familiar things such as toasters and refrigerators popular at the beginning of the 20th century. At first, the company's only business was to produce and distribute one of Edison's inventions, the vacuum tube, for which the inventor's authority was of great help. Since many buyers were interested in the new technology, not because of its economical efficiency, but because it was developed by Edison himself. However, the company's success isn't just based on the legendary founder's name alone. This isn't the case. Even after his death in 1931, the company continued its relentless operations and finally managed to become famous for developing the first American jet craft, as well as an electron microscope and building the world's first commercial nuclear power plant. The company bravely survived all crises and won people's steadfast trust. There was even a saying on Wall Street in the 2000s, if you want to invest but you don't know what to invest in, buy General Electric. After watching this video to the end, you'll know the secret of this innovative company. Company Foundation In 1878, Thomas Edison, who was already well known for his inventions at that time, founded General Electric which was originally called Edison Electric, or Edison Illuminating Company. It wasn't just an enterprise that he founded, but a laboratory where people were developing new products and most importantly, were solving issues related to their practical use. That is, the primary goal was to commercialize the product. He set these priorities after patenting his first invention, the electronic voice recording machine, which was so slow that it didn't have a demand in the market. After that, Edison came out with a motto, never invent something unless it's marketable. Modern R&D or research and development centers follow the principles of General Electric laboratories. These were where students, developers, and other enthusiasts could bring their innovations to the world. The first lamp. Edison had set an ambitious task for himself and his recently founded company to illuminate the world with electricity. He was looking for an alternative to gas and oil lamps, which were the main light sources at the time. He managed to achieve the first success in 1879, when he created and patented the first electric lamp, also known as an incandescent lamp. Indeed, even before Edison's invention, investors from all over the world presented various versions of lamps. As for the incandescent lamp, the first version of this lamp was invented and patented by scientists from Canada in 1874. But these inventors failed to find money to finalize their invention. Five years later, Edison bought the Canadian's patent for $5,000, enhanced it, and presented it to the world. And it's not just about legal issues. Edison was really the first to create a commercially viable electric lamp with 1,200 hours of service life. He used charred fibers of Japanese bamboo as a filament in the lamp. So how did he come up with that? By trial and error. Although we shouldn't speak about errors in this case. Remember that Edison himself said, I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. To find this material, his laboratory experimented with silk, paper, cardboard, and even nutshells. Business and no offense. The next stage was a power supply system. Edison opened the first power plant in 1882, which made it possible for New York to switch to incandescent lamps, which worked on direct current from the power plant built by Edison. It provided electricity to New York only, but the company began to make money on vacuum tubes. The revenues were invested in building power plants in other US and later European cities, since General Electric's goal was to illuminate the whole world. This is how the Italian company Continental Edison was founded. Edison provided it with a license to use his inventions and technologies to build power plants in particular. A young genius, Nikola Tesla, 
worked out one of these power plants in Strasbourg. However, Tesla wasn't paid the $25,000 promised to him for his work, and he quit and left for the U.S., where he got a job at General Electric. There, he was hired by Edison himself, who promised him a bonus of $50,000 if the young inventor managed to find a way to improve the direct current machine. Tesla found 24 ways to upgrade the machine and was left without any bonus. Explaining this, Edison said that it was a joke and the immigrant failed to understand American humor. Tesla quit and founded his own company two years later. It wasn't only Tesla who worked for Edison. The company was developing and creating more and more jobs. Thus, Henry Ford got a job at General Electric as a mechanic in 1891. When working for Edison's company, the future father of the American car industry was invited to one of the social parties where he met his boss, Edison. By that time, Ford had already attracted attention for his invention, a horseless carriage. Edison was impressed by Ford's invention and his enthusiasm and urged him to stick to his idea tooth and nail. Ford followed his hero's advice and soon quit General Electric. Later, he started his own car manufacturing business. Competitor. In the 1880s, Edison and his company were focused on developing the market, providing more and more incandescent lamps to illuminate cities, as well as building power plants to power those very lamps. In fact, the market was empty. Edison was one of the pioneers, which made him a kind of monopolist. But a serious competitor appeared on the market in 1886. George Westinghouse and his company, which bought 40 patents for alternating current electric equipment from Nikola Tesla. To power his incandescent lamps, Edison used low-voltage direct current, while Westinghouse used high-voltage alternating current for his arc lamps. The main problems with direct current was that a significant amount of energy was lost when transmitted over long distances, so this method was effective only at short distances up to one and a half kilometers from a power plant. The solution to this problem required building many local stations, which wasn't cheap for a city and its residents, but there were few alternatives. At the same time, Edison benefited from it. The need in power plants generated tidy income for Edison's company since it was them who built them. As for alternating current, it can be transmitted over long distances via high voltage lines. On the downside, transmission of alternating current was a high voltage process, which made it very unstable and unsafe and didn't allow to supply electricity to residential buildings. However, Westinghouse managed to solve this problem. He began to use transformers to decrease the voltage. This innovation made the power transmission system safe. Edison understood this, but he didn't give up. He had a plan. War of Currents Edison started with claiming that high voltage in the alternating current systems is dangerous, and the electrical equipment for alternating current violates his company's patents. He applied to court with this accusation, but lost the case. Edison started an information war. The task was to convince people that alternating current is unstable and can easily take people's lives. At the time, the USA practiced execution by hanging. Under the pretext of a more humane execution method, Edison managed to promote the idea of using alternating current as an alternative to the gallows, an electric chair. The New York City authorities ordered a generator for the electric chair from Westinghouse, who wasn't happy with this order. He didn't want a public demonstration of a murder with alternating current, so he refused to supply the equipment and hired lawyers for the defendant, who was to be electrocuted. However, Edison arranged with Westinghouse's main competitor, Thomas Houston Electric Company. Noteworthy that the company was also doing research in alternating current, but provided a generator for the execution. The execution took place in Auburn Prison, New York, 1890. William Kemmler, accused of killing his wife with an axe, became the first electrocuted person in the world. Westinghouse commented on the execution with the following words, they would have done better with an axe. The information war continued. Mass media widely covered deaths from high voltage alternating current lines, and Edison's people filmed another execution which was supposed to finally nurture people's fear and horror of alternating current, the execution of Topsy the Elephant. 
Edison's campaign aimed at degenerating his competitors, or rather their technologies, and it was a great success. The so-called War of Currents was gradually becoming less tense. But to secure an even stronger position on the market, Edison's electric company merged with Thomas Houston Electric Company in 1892. The merged company was called General Electric. The new company controlled three quarters of the U.S. electrical business. Edison left the company in 1892 and sold all of his shares in 1894, while still working as a consulting advisor. Edison preferred inventing to business. It should be mentioned that Westinghouse didn't sink right away either. His company won the bid for illuminating the world's Columbian exhibition in Chicago in 1893. Westinghouse invited Tesla, who prepared a show, during which two million volts of current was flowing through him. Light bulbs lit up in his hands, but he was unharmed. People were impressed, but the fear of alternating current remained in the public's hearts. Let the light in. Having merged with Thomas Houston Electric, the new company had all the resources it needed to distribute its lamps all over the globe. But there were two problems. Not all houses were electrified, and not all people really needed it, and still used gas lamps, which were cheaper and more common. Because of this, General Electric faced two tasks. First, to improve their lamps, making them cheaper, more reliable, and more convenient. And second, to create such conditions that people couldn't imagine their lives without electricity, including household chores. The first task couldn't be solved once and for all. However, in 1906, the company obviously achieved success and began producing lamps on an industrial scale. They changed the filament material from bamboo fiber to tungsten, which is still used today. For this, they bought a patent for tungsten from a Russian scientist. Alexander Nikolaevich Lodigan conducted the first experiment in lighting screens with incandescent electric lamps in St. Petersburg in 1873. Only two out of the four lamps blew. The service life of the lamps reached up to a thousand hours. However, in his homeland, the scientist was associated with revolutionaries who were arrested in 1884, and Lodigan decided to leave the country. Lodigan then patented his idea of using a metal thread of tungsten, osmium, iridium, and palladium in the U.S. in 1890, and sold his patent to General Electric in 1906. However, since the tungsten filament was quite difficult to produce, General Electric managed to reach industrial-scale production only after an improved method was invented by William Coolidge, a scientist working for General Electric in 1910. Meanwhile, there was another problem related to the filament quickly evaporating in the vacuum, which was solved by General Electric's other employee, Irving Lagomir, who suggested producing lamps filled with inert or rather heavy noble gases such as argon, which increased their service life and improved light output. However, the company couldn't be completely satisfied with success until solving the second task. If there's no electricity everywhere, not everyone would need their lamps. To solve this problem, General Electric started producing refrigerators because refrigerators always need electricity. The company heavily invested in this production and launched a large-scale advertising campaign. After a few years of hard work, General Electric took the lead in this market segment. At the time, their refrigerator cost about $300, which is about $4,000 in today's prices. But even this price still was three times cheaper than competitors. A decade later, a refrigerator will become an integral part of the American home interior, and by 1962, 98% of American families had a refrigerator compared to only 20 in Europe and 5 in the USSR. Management The best scientists and investors of the 20th century worked in General Electric's laboratories or R&D centers. For example, Nobel Prize winners Irving Langemeer and Ivar Giaver. A minor invention every 10 days and a major invention every six months. Thanks to this working principle, which was established by Edison himself, the company easily created new industries. For over 100 years, General Electric had been one of the most reliable and profitable companies in the world. However, extensions also caused certain difficulties. Not all industries turned out to be profitable. 
Besides, the company management simply failed to cope with such high workload, which was especially felt in the 1970s. A new CEO, Jack Welch, managed to lead the company out of the crisis. Over 20 years in position, from 1981 to 2001, he managed to increase the conglomerate's value from $14 billion to $400 billion, for which he is known as the manager of the century. After leaving the company, he shared the principles which helped him to achieve this. Change yourself before you have to do it. It's important to react to changes as they come. You must be ready for them and react quickly. When the speed of outer changes exceeds the speed of inner changes, the end is near. Simplicity and clarity are the key to success. It's important that every person in the company, from the top to the bottom, understands what the business is striving for. The results of these principles speak for themselves. Welch gave up those business directions that weren't at least second to the industry and fired up to 10% of the most inefficient employees based on annual reports that compare the employee's performance. Nowadays, the company has refused this annual reporting system. They've introduced a system that implies that an employee, including the company managers, is evaluated by an independent auditor. It works as follows. The company employee uses an app to send his work results to the auditor, who provides feedback. At the same time, the employee's management doesn't get the auditor's report, it's only the employee himself who sees it. This system makes employees more honest in their reports, as well as look forward to the feedback with great enthusiasm, being ready for the changes that could help their personal performance. However, this system also has a drawback. How can the management decide on the employee's salaries if they get no information about their performance? So, it may happen that the company still has a shadow reporting for the company management. On the other hand, an employee's or a manager's performance in any company can be judged by his work results. Instead of relying on the notorious reports that management and many companies use as a tool to punish subordinates. Understanding this, many employees of different companies have learned to compile these reports as to avoid punishment. That is, to report untrustworthy information and avoid and despise the auditors who provide information to the management, seeing them as a kind of watchdog of the management. Conclusion Nowadays, this global corporation is having a rough time. In the year 2017, the company's stock price almost halved from $30 to $18. Warren Buffett got rid of all the General Electric stocks in the same year. Back in its day, the company managed to survive the Great Depression, the death of its founder, as well as two world wars, after which it became famous for cooperation with the Apollo program. Their developments included rugged rubber for the soles of the astronauts' boots and transparent lexin, a polycarbonate resin that replaced glass. This material was used to make visors for the astronauts who conquered the moon. The current situation in the company is far from its first crisis, but perhaps the last one. Who knows? <laughs>